Hello everyone and welcome to the continuing development of my T-38 shuttle in Kerbal Space Program 1.2.2 and in this episode we begin with a version that doesn't ignite the Vanguard engines on the T-38 at launch. You can see here that we've got the three engines on the Atlas booster and then the two SRBs on the side of the Atlas booster, so asymmetrical in this case, and barely stable. We dump the two SRBs and then ignite an airlit one. Uh, these are still caster 1s. I don't know if there was an airlit caster 1, but we'll just assume that they could manage to make one. And there goes the final caster 1, and we continue with the three engines of the Atlas booster. So, a bit asymmetrical, but it seems to be possible to balance it, at least for now. And here we're coming up on booster separation, so the two booster engines from the Atlas rocket, and now we're just on the LR-105. And at a certain point, we need to ignite the Vanguard engines in order to maintain the balance, because uh, uh, Smart ASS was not pitching at the right pitch at all for a while there. And now it's somewhat recovered, and we have to sort of readjust it. And as the fuel runs out in the Atlas booster, we have to shut down the LR-105 and decouple it, so I'm keeping an eye on that. And there we go, off it goes. And now just on the Vanguard engines and the internal fuel of the T-38. I tried to fix the decoupler, but you can see those six prongs there. I mean, the rest of the decoupler isn't there, but I still have those six little dots and the lines connecting them, so that was annoying. Anyway, we actually ended up higher than we should have, and so the first job was to have our RCS lower the orbit for once instead of having it a finished orbit. You can see some other changes to the T-38. Instead of having the wing tip pods, I just put two RCS ports on the top of the wings. They're not as well shielded. They only have a heat tolerance of 1,073 uh, Kelvin, uh, but uh, they're lighter and they obstruct the airflow less. So hopefully, and of course they were overheating previously. So anyway, we're in a sort of one and a half hour orbit. But we're going to immediately deorbit now as we pass over Australia. I bring the periapsis down to 40 kilometers, and I decide that that would be a good deorbit height from this orbit. And we'll see. I did the deorbit burn around 150 degrees east, and here we are entering the atmosphere. Other changes I moved the rear RCS ports a little bit further back, and uh, I tweaked the amount of lead that we were carrying in the tail. I was hoping that that would help our balance, but I don't think it really did. And here we are over Baja California and over Mexico, and we are clearly going long here. We are not making it to Florida properly. We're going to overshoot that mark as we're approaching 100 kilometers. No overheating yet. But there we have overheating, and it's actually the RCS ports on the wings, which I thought would be better shielded by the wings themselves. But uh, yeah, they had a little overheating indicators, and by uh, 76 kilometers here in altitude, we started going up. And you can see I'm allowing for full use of the RCS. I had had it on the caps lock before. We made up to almost 80 kilometers. This is pretty typical for my sort of flight profiles of shuttles. Uh, between 75 and 80 kilometers in altitude, we do tend to skip up. We could probably avoid that by having a lower periapsis, but in any case, this is sort of based on the Dinosaur, the X-20 uh, project, and that was going to be a skip glider, so it was going to do this all day. Uh, it was about 4.7 tons empty mass. This one's 4.2, so it's lighter than the dinosaur would have been. But then again, the dinosaur was sort of reinforced for a lot more skipping. And I still haven't added more heat shielding to the cockpit here. As you can see, uh, our, our RCS ports are fine now, but the cockpit is severely overheated. And we are descending below 58 kilometers, uh, 4,000, let's say 4,500 ish meters per second. And we're actually going up a little bit, but it sort of stores the heat. And so, uh, well, it exploded at 56 kilometers. Taking a look at the log, uh, it showed that the heat tolerance was at 1073 Kelvin for the cockpit. I thought that was wrong. I thought I had heat shielded it better than that. So I upped the heat shielding to 1500 max temp. Uh, which it should be anyway. I mean, it's ridiculous. I already added an extra ton of mass to the T-38, so 
I assume it's fair to get a little bit more heat shielding on the darn thing. So yeah, here we launch again. Uh, the skin, max skin temp is another thing, and I think that's around 2000 Kelvin. Okay, uh, there is a difference with this one. It's not Vanguard engines anymore. Since we're air lighting them anyway, I decided to go with Agena engines, which are less powerful. And there is a drawback to that. I mean, the Agenas are supposed to be air lit, whereas the Vanguard engines are supposed to be ground lit. But the Agena engines at this phase, because I'm using 1961 technology, weren't that much more efficient than the Vanguard engines because they were UD using UDMH and um, nitric acid. And these are Agena B variants of the uh, Agena engines. And, well, we end up not being able to use enough fuel with the booster and we do not have enough delta v to make orbit now that can be adjusted by carrying less fuel for the agena we're basically carrying an agena stage on top of the atlas rocket right now in order to fuel the t38 but it's the drawback is because we can't use the kerosene oxygen in the atlas rocket to fuel the t38 anymore before the vanguard engine was sharing the fuel with the Atlas's own engines. Now it can't do that because it's using a different fuel mix. And so that's part of the problem. Basically that means that there's residual kerosene and oxygen and also residual UDMH and nitric acid in the Atlas booster once we decouple it. And that's where the inefficiency is. But here we continue. I'm just carrying less fuel for the Agena engines here at the top of the Atlas rocket and carrying a little bit more kerosene and oxygen in the hope that, that would help the balance. And you can see the balance here. We're still going to leave some fuel in the tank that we can't use. We shut off the LR-105. And it's a fair amount of fuel there. And we release it. I mean, it's either that or having some sort of lead weight at the top of the Atlas to help the balance, but that's going to use extra fuel anyway. Alright, so that is as far as we get with the Agena engines, and I decided that that's good enough to try and use the RCS to finish orbit. And we are actually carrying a little bit more RCS fuel than on the Vanguard flights, so that's good. And uh, perhaps if we weren't carrying the extra fuel, the Agena would have been able to get us to orbit. The two Agena engines, I mean. Okay, but here we are deorbiting, and this is the part we're most interested in. We got to orbit just fine. Well, we got to orbit barely, and now we are trying to come back. And based on the previous deorbit, I decided to move it up a little bit. I think I made a deorbit burn at 120 degrees east. And here we are starting our descent through the atmosphere at 140 kilometers. And at 100 kilometers, you can see our current location and velocities. It's holding its nose up very well at 40 degrees. Of course, we've still got all of our pitch authority active. I haven't turned on the fine controls yet. 90 kilometers, that's where we're at. And I'm showing you at all these various intervals, 85 kilometers, uh, because we're actually going to make it. <laughs> Spoilers! Um, so, yeah, uh, take notes. This is, uh, this is how it's done, I guess. Um, so here we have fine controls descending through 80 kilometers. As usual, between 75 and 80 kilometers, I expect a little bit of lift, but not that much this time, actually. And that's because it's holding its 40 kilometer pitch very well. Uh, it's interesting, the Agena engines are lighter than the, than the Vanguard engines, and I compensated by adding more lead mass. So... In theory, we should still have the same empty mass and everything. We might be a little bit lighter, though, so that might help. Here we are over Mexico now, and you can see that the cockpit is still heating up even with the higher heat tolerances. So are those RCS ports, but uh, at least it's holding that pitch up. Yep, 40 degrees. Still, the decoupler leaves behind those little prongs, and boy, are they heat resistant. And 60 kilometers. We are over the Gulf of Mexico, and a mere 3,400 meters per second now, so deceleration has worked out. Now we would really like the cockpit to cool off. Still isn't at 55 kilometers, and we are approaching the Florida coast. Now, we basically did an orbit once around, so we only did one orbit, and the Earth has rotated, so we're offset from the KSC. We're actually aimed more at Miami, 
and you'll notice that I've pitched down here and that's to get lift. Uh, I was afraid that we were falling short of uh, Florida. I at least wanted to set down on land, but I didn't think that we would be able to make the turn to the KSC because that's much further north at this point. You can see Tampa Bay there as we descend through 45 kilometers. And yeah, I decided that this was an okay pitch to get some lift to make sure we set down on land. But then we actually started going up. I've allowed the RCS to just burn off. I wanted to empty those tanks anyway. So that's what we're doing here. And this is how we're aimed at this point. Uh, you can sort of see Miami slightly to our right. Uh, that city on the further coast. And here I decided to start having Smart ASS turn us. We still got the overheating indicator on the cockpit, but we're so slow right now. We're basically Mach 4. And at this altitude, uh, that's reasonable for this. This plane can handle that at this altitude. Okay, and still turning using the rest of our RCS fuel. And it's looking like we might actually be able to turn towards the north at least. Now we're below Mach 3. So nearing the normal flight regime for a T-38, though the T-38 currently does not have jet engines, so it's going to have to be a dead stick landing. Of course, I'm not entirely sure whether that term is only used for the case where the engines go out accidentally rather than deliberately, but anyway, you get the idea. So here we are, 15 kilometers, and actually we're lighter than I thought we were empty. We're at uh, 3.9 tons. And I think that is because of the engine replacement. Also, the removal of the little RCS pods. They're not that heavy, but they're still heavy enough on such a light aircraft. I might have to boost the empty mass of this then, uh, just to make it a little bit more legit. But we could use more advanced Gina engines and quit with the competing against Mercury and Vostok, for instance, and move to like 1965-ish time frame and see what we can do with those kinds of engines. Maybe we can make this a little bit more productive in a way. Still keep the Agena engines, but the uprated Agena engines, they're a lot more useful. But here we are aiming at the shuttle landing facility. It was nice having a choice of uh, two runways, but as expected, I was going far too fast to try and land at the KSC runway. And I've still neglected to put air brakes on the T-30. It does have them on the underside and I did not place them there. They could have been really useful in this case, but alas. But then again, I don't know if they would still keep them there if they were going to heat shield the underside of the T-38. Not entirely sure about that. But here we go. Preparing for the landing. And obviously going too fast, that goes without saying. Uh, I only have one shot at this. There was definitely no going around. So we're just going to have to take care of it. Fortunately, it's a long runway. And... Oop! Bit of a bounce. And... That's a better one. Alright, slowing down thanks to the brakes. And, but it's still a little bit fast for this this plane so it skids a bit. There's a bit of a skiddy runway sometimes. And I do a full, a nearly a full 360 there. Into the parking space, I, I think. That's, that's my story. Anyway, so there you go. T-38 shuttle. It made it. It works. Well, uh, well, barely, but still. We could refine it. I think there are things we can do with this. Make it a little bit more useful. But there are limitations. Obviously, the structure isn't meant to carry cargo, and maybe we should deviate to other designs. We'll think about it. I mean, what other planes would you like to see turned into shuttles? I don't know. Uh, give you recommendations. Uh, obviously, if it's a propeller plane, it's going to have to get jets instead. Uh, it's probably a bad idea anyway. But yeah. I'll, I'll leave that for now and say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.